invited me to come back to Hartford and be with you. Been here a couple times before, and I've always had a nice, warm uh, reception. Uh, people, neighbors and friends here, it's great to see you all. I, uh, my, my talk tonight, I've done, done many times, and the, the title that I use is The Great Sheep Boom in its enduring legacy on the landscape, all right? So that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. But now, um, before I do that, I, I want to do something, and somebody begged me to do this. And uh, you can holler me down and, and tell me to stop if you want. But uh, for several years, my boys have been pestering me to write down uh, some of the memories uh, of growing up in this area from childhood all the way up through, and things that I have done. And uh, so a year ago, I, I set about to, uh, to write up some things, and uh, it, uh, it turned out <laughs> way more of a project than I had envisioned. Uh, so anyway, a, a long story short, I ended up in a, in a book, which I uh, created and uh, gave to my, my family members and friends around Plainfield and Meriden, and it's kind of gone here and there. It's not a commercial venture, and I never charged anybody a nickel. Uh, but uh, in there is one little section, and I thought, if you don't mind, I'll read it to you, because it's relevant to you people right here. And uh, this... It, 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 you will see, I think, uh, as I read it, it comes from the heart, all right? White River Junction, summer of 1957. It hadn't changed much in generations, and it was still a rugged railroad town. Downtown stores hadn't yet been destroyed by the Vermont sales tax that came a decade later. The slow decay of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s hadn't set in, and the rejuvenation and hipster vibe were still more than a half century in the future. White River Junction in 1957 is forever locked in among my fondest memories. I worked that summer at the Swift & Company branch on South Main Street, an adolescent doing men's work amid grizzled war veterans, ever happy, to test the mettle of a strong kid with much to learn about hard physical labor and handling job pressure. I toiled away for a dollar ten an hour, kept my mouth shut, and got educated about the meat business. But it was the environment around the Swift plant that became ever more fascinating as the weeks of that summer rolled by. Foremost was the dominance of the railroad. Rail yards stretched a mile south next to the Connecticut River, a half mile northwest along the White, and across the bridge to more trackage in West Lebanon. Switching engines shuttled back and forth day and night, sorting cars and assembling freight trains for movement along the Boston Main lines to the south, east, and north, and the central Vermont Canadian National to the northwest. Regularly scheduled passenger trains came and went around the clock. Nothing like in the 1940s when 50 or more arrivals a day were the norm, but enough so that there were a half dozen Boston, New York, and Montreal departures every day. In the age of steam, White River Junction and its sister village over the bridge, West Lebanon, shared a common residue of coal smoke and cinders on all of their building exteriors. It was a dull, dark gray, similar to the image of structures portrayed in photographs taken in the late 19th century. By 1957, locomotives were uniformly diesel-powered, but many of the junction's buildings had yet to receive fresh paint. The Postal Service still ran mail cars with sorters working on board, and Railway Express had a busy station adjacent to the passenger terminal. Swift had four refrigerated rail cars arrive in the yard by five o'clock Monday mornings. We'd unload the first two, then call for a switching engine and crew to come and spot the other two on the plant siding. Bogle Brothers Jewelry Store on Gate Street maintained the trainmen's watches, hanging them on a special board on a wall where the pieces were swapped periodically to be tested for accuracy according to railroad rules. 
Rail service supported various enterprises arrayed around the sprawling yards. As many as eight different livestock feed dealers were located between the junction and West Lebanon. Twin state fruit got produced by refrigerated rail cars. Bulk commodities like coal, lumber, and petroleum rolled in. Boston, Maine had a large freight house, and Cadillacs bound for the Miller Automobile Company on Gate Street came in boxcars. Across from the Swift plant was a neighborhood market that catered to the Italian community clustered further down South Maine, run by a true son of Italy, Babe Falzerano. Just up the street was the Junction Restaurant, where we Swift workers attired in our white frocks and aprons went for morning coffee break. Further up was the downtown district with banks, the Hotel Coolidge, two drug stores, Kolodny's Surprise Department Store, a newsstand, Western Union office, movie theater, stationer, J.J. Newbury's post office, two diners, furniture store, funeral parlor, state liquor store, and a lively bar. Along the fringes were the tip-top bakery, the Ford dealership, a tire recapping plant, various wholesale distributors, a lumberyard, and the White River Hide and Tallow Company, an odiferous outfit that collected bones, fats, and guts from meat and poultry processes over a wide area and forwarded the stuff along to renderers. About that bar, at the time it was called Teddy's. Later it became the 494, after the junction's mascot, B&M Steam Locomotive, old number 94. The bar was close to a busy underpass and backed up to railroad tracks with their constant shuttling of freight cars. I slipped in a few times and got served without an ID check, even though I was only 17. The band was loud and lots of people danced, including an old man who sashayed around the floor by himself but posed as if he had a partner. I learned his name was Frank. He was a widower and often came down to Teddy's from Bethel on the train for the evening and returned home, again by rail, at closing time, a routine he'd been following for years. By far the most interesting and engaging business in all of White River Junction in those days was the Lang Hardware Store. Its inventory was vast and much of it harkened back to the turn of the 20th century. You could find all kinds of kerosene lamps, candle making molds, bones and spigots for cider barrels, clothes ringers and washboards, knob and tube electrical supplies, and throwback hand tools. The closest I've ever come to a store like it would be an Amish hardware store and farm supply enterprise I once visited in Ohio. This emporium was presided over by Wyndham Lang, who had run it since before World War I. The commercial side of White River Junction was eclectic and interesting, and the people were similarly diverse and engaging. There were the railroad men, easily spotted in their denim frocks and overalls. Many women worked the shifts as telephone operators at the block-like regional toll center at the edge of downtown. There were Yankee families, French Canadians, Irish, and a large number of Italians whose roots traced back to stonecutters who came to build structures for the railroads at the turn of the 20th century. White River Junction in 1957 also attracted tramps and hobos, some of whom would show up at the loading dock at the Swift plant looking for a handout. We'd hack off a fist-sized chunk of bologna, and they'd walk off, eating it like an apple. I grieved when I watched the railroads shrivel, passenger trains vanish and tracks being torn up, taking the heart out of the town. Then it lost its retail stores one by one. Lang Hardware was auctioned off and the Swift plant was shuttered along with uh, the wholesale businesses. I came to call myself lucky to have seen and experienced White River Junction at its most vibrant, vibrant in that summer of 1957. Okay? So... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and now my voice said, you, you've got to read this one. Here's just three paragraphs, but you'll get a kick out of it. You all know what I'm talking about. The Tunbridge Fair as it once was. Okay. Yes, it was good that a crusading young minister came to town
and led the charge to clean up the wild, alcohol-fueled atmosphere of the Tunbridge Fair and get rid of its reputation as the Drunkard's Reunion. That was in the early 1960s. But before that, I got to experience the fair as it had been for generations. My father told of going to Tunbridge Fair in 1927 in the middle of Prohibition and seeing in the nearby cemetery a hearse with Quebec license plates containing a coffin from which bottles of whiskey were being dispensed. You could carry and consume alcohol anywhere on the fairgrounds when I went three or four times in the late 1950s. The midway was supposed to be off limits for drinking, but I couldn't see much compliance with that. Indeed, most fair growers seemed either drunk or working hard to become so. I have a vivid memory of a stout, shirtless woman sitting in the grandstand nursing a baby while chugging a bottle of Black Label beer. Just off the midway were strip show tents with clusters of rowdy men eyeing and jeering the strippers sent out to lure customers inside. Despite all the boozing and wild behavior, the fair, the fair still had the feel and color of the rural agriculture of Vermont that would rapidly fade when the interstates arrived. The New York money started flowing in and the state's political and social fabric would undergo complete upheaval. The ox pulling featured teams of normal size and conformation, not the freakish hybrid mammoth beasts that dominate the poles in modern times. Standard breads, the farmer's horse, ran in the harness races and local granges went all out with their exhibits of handiwork and baked foods. The Tunbridge Fair is one of the finest agricultural fairs in New England today and tries hard to stick to its roots in farming culture. But I'm glad I got to actually experience the fair the way <clears throat> it became the stuff of legend. I did catch a bit of the flavor <laughs> of the old Tunbridge Fair along about 2018, uh, 2008 when Gretchen, that's my wife, and I were ambling over to the cattle barns and were spotted by legendary Vermont character Fred Tuttle seated in a lawn chair by the entryway. Fred peered up at me and asked, are you drunk? I responded I wasn't. Fred shot back, don't you know you're supposed to come to the fair drunk with somebody else's wife? <laughs> that, was, that was fun. Anyway, so that, that's, that's my stab at being an author, and it's been a lot of fun. To, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> growing up in Plainfield, I mean, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories I couldn't print, you know. I wouldn't dare. I'd end up in court. <laughs> anyway, so you are talking about sheep boom and its, uh, its legacy. I mean, what I say applies in New Hampshire, applies in Vermont, and, and most certainly right around here, because uh, this, this was a hotbed of sheep, as I will explain. Uh, but uh, before we really get into it, you just have, kind of have to understand what this area was like when the first settlements began to come in with the chartering of places like Hartford and Heartland and Windsor and Wethersfield, Lebanon, Plainfield, Lyme, and so on. Uh, it was all forest, vast forest, huge forest. And these people were being sold uh, uh, deals. They, they were, uh, these speculators in Connecticut were, were finding people to come up here and start farming and uh, offer them cheap uh, land to come and establish but there's this tremendous forest here. How in the world can you get agriculture going if it's, uh, the land is covered with huge beech, oak, maple, uh, ash, and other uh, species that may be five or six feet thick? Well, uh, to do that, what they did, they set out uh, to clear the land in a most brutal way. Okay. A lot of the good timber, particularly the pine along the riverbanks, uh, that was used for a saw timber, ship masts, and that sort of thing. But this hardwood forest that dominated the hills was a different challenge. And what they set out to do basically was to clear the land in a very brutal way. Uh, they burned a lot of it down. Just, just would girdle trees, kill the trees, get them to dry out for a couple of years so there'd be no leaves and they could begin scratching around in the dirt on the forest floor, plant uh, oats, barley, wheat, and get some crops growing 
uh, while they waited for those, uh, those dead trees to, to dry down enough so you could set fire to them and get them to burn. Well, you won't, won't burn a, a, a big, thick butt. Uh, you'll just have to wait a while until the roots rot enough. You can hitch the oxen up and pull over the, the stub out of the way and end up with what we call today a meadow, a field, a pasture. We have no conception of what they did to clear land. I mean, it was an incredible undertaking. They didn't have any chainsaws. They didn't have any excavators, bulldozers, or anything. It was all done with hand labor and oxen and, uh, and fire. Imagine the smoke and the pollution and everything. It's interesting, one of the first, probably the first cash crop that this land generated around here was ashes. The ashes from burning all this wood up. The ashes had value because they contained potassium and they gathered up ashes and put them in barrels and uh, uh, potassium essential product for making gunpowder, glass, soap, and a whole bunch of other important uh, uh, commodities. And so they would uh, barrel up these damn ashes and, and sh ship them down country uh, for sale. So anyway, we're clearing land, we're getting agriculture going, and these settlers are trying to carve out a living uh, here on the ground. And I have to emphasize right here how important the cow was to the survival of this, of this uh, enterprise. Uh, without the cow, I would argue, much of this couldn't have happened at the time. Uh, the people would have perished because the cow is a marvelous machine in support of humankind. The cow produces all kinds of benefits. Number one, she produces storable fat and protein for the human diet. In other words, her milk contains fat and solids that uh, provide protein and fat. Uh, and can be stored with some salt uh, in the form of butter and cheese. Uh, the cow produces meat. Uh, her flesh can be smoked and stored. Uh, the cow produces leather, a very, very important commodity for all kinds of uses. Uh, the cow produces offspring. If it's a female, of course, it, it joins the herd, grows the herd. And uh, if it's a male, it can be castrated and become an ox. Uh, and oxen were the primary motive uh, power in, in this time for forestry and for, for uh, agriculture and transportation. And then the, uh, the cow produces a wonderful product every day, manure, all right? The soil around here is not the greatest. Uh, you add manure to it and you can grow crops. So here, think about the cow as a wonderful uh, uh, generator of sub, uh, sustenance for, for humans in many different ways. Uh, well, a, a, as land is cleared, uh, uh, initially it's subsistence agriculture. After the Re Revolutionary War, it had grown, the agricultural enterprise had grown sufficiently that there was sur some surplus of, of livestock and grain that could be shipped uh, out of the area to the more urban areas to the south. And so that was the, basically, the, the 1700s, that was that period. So that gets us up to, we'll, uh, we'll cut it off at 1809, which is a watershed year for this whole thing. There were sheep here, there were quite a few sheep, but the animals were small, they didn't have much for fleeces. They were largely kept on farms simply to produce some wool, which could be processed in the home into, into textiles, you know, homespun uh, for blankets and garments. Uh, they, they originated mostly in England, and uh, wool processing was a cottage industry. But in 1809, Thomas Jefferson was president, and he appointed a Boston businessman named William Jarvis to be the American ambassador to the Spanish court. Uh, Jarvis, a uh, very interesting individual, obviously he was politically com connected uh, that Thomas Jefferson would entrust uh, him to represent uh, American interests uh, before uh, the royalty of, of Spain. Uh, but uh, Jarvis also owned an important farm in Wethersfield Bow, Vermont right down the river from us here. Uh, it's not clear why this worked out the way it did. 
but uh, Jarvis uh, had that farm and he was, he was very deeply committed to agriculture and he was a very progressive farmer uh, in addition to being a very successful businessman in Boston. It's interesting, uh, some Jarvis descendants, uh, mostly of his brother uh, Andrew, uh, still live down in West Claremont where there's Jarvis Hill. They have a large uh, land holding there and the two brothers, uh, William and Andrew, uh, converse back and forth by a ferry right there and you can go and see where those ferry landings were on either side of the river today. So anyway, Jarvis arrives in Lisbon and, and presents his credentials to the Spanish court. And uh, first thing he does is go out in the countryside and take a look around. There he sees vast flocks of incredible sheep, unlike anything back home in New England. Sheep with deep, deep, thick fleeces. And today we kind of use a generic breed term for them. We call them merinos. But there were several different breeds uh, in Spain recognized uh, there. Uh, but today we just, let's just call them merinos. Up to that point, the European nobility had resisted or had embargoed good breeding stock. They didn't want uh, good uh, genetics to be exported to the New World because they feared competition. Uh, but at this point, the Spanish court was facing imminent threat of invasion from Napoleon. Napoleon and his hordes were ready, to, poised to attack, and they needed to raise money to wage war. So Jarvis and an Englishman swung a deal to buy some of these sheep. They bought about 15,000 of them. They divvied them up. About half of them came here. Now just imagine if you had 7,500 sheep, how the hell would you get them to New England? Uh, that, that in itself must have been an incredible undertaking. Load them on a ship. Uh, you've got to have water for them. You've got to have feed. You've got to care for them and get them here in a journey that might take 80 or 90 days. Well, anyway, they managed to get a lot of them here. Uh, Jarvis saw to it that 300 of the very best uh, were uh, sent to his farm in Wethersfield, Vermont. Again, imagine from Newburyport, Massachusetts to uh, Wethersfield, Vermont, distance of about 110 miles, somebody had to drive those sheep overland to get them there. Uh, quite a challenge. Well, other people got in on this deal. Now, it was interesting, Mr. Jarvis pulling this deal off. Obviously, in those days, they didn't have any ethics laws. You know, you're a, an agent of the United States government. On the side, you can make a little money. Uh, no, that doesn't happen today, of course, no. But uh, back then, they, they could get away with it. Um, so, uh, very soon, there were more of these wonderful sheep arriving. And word got around here of sheep that produce tremendous fleeces. We've got to have some of that breeding stock on our farm. And people would, uh, by whatever means, acquire a ram to crossbreed with the sheep they already had here. Uh, they'd try to get three or four ewes, a foundation. And in a matter of a decade, we have explosive growth in numbers over in central New England. It's mostly Vermont, southern, uh, southeastern New Hampshire, down into central Massachusetts a bit, and a little bit in, in southern Maine. But this was really the, the, the epicenter, right around where we are today. Uh, and so uh, the explosive numbers of sheep, it's just so dramatic. Uh, in my town, we have wonderful records because they tax sheep uh, every year. And we can look at the number. In Plainfield, New Hampshire, 1815, there were 1,100 sheep. By 1825, there were 9,000. You see, they were building up the flocks, and uh, they were beginning to make money. Now, I will argue that this period was the only period in New England agricultural history where fortunes were made, that people got rich farming. People who got in on this boom uh, did very, very well. We've never seen anything like it, uh, uh, what, what, what this was able to accomplish. Uh, dramatic growth in numbers of, of sheep spreading over this land that had been cleared. 
uh, for uh, pasturage and for production of hay to feed them. Uh, it, is, uh, it is argued that south of the White Mountains in New Hampshire, about 80% of the land had been cleared by 1825. And uh, uh, clearly uh, the same would be true in Vermont. Uh, uh, great swaths of land cleared for agriculture and this sheep boom taking over uh, and putting that land to work. Well, with that sudden appearance of a resource of wool coming off these farms, attracted capital from Boston and New York to develop mills to process the wool into textiles. And that is the beginning of the mill economy of New England. That is the beginning of what we call mill towns. Don't have too many mill towns in Vermont because you don't have the rivers with us the steep waterfalls like New Hampshire has, uh, you know, like Claremont, like Lebanon. Uh, Queechy, yes, West Hartford, yes, but not, not to the extent of the mill towns we have on the other side of the river. But anyway, mills being built. You go down to Claremont in that district, they call it the Mill District, right along the Sugar River, where the Sugar River drops about 150 feet and a quarter of a mile. Tremendous uh, horsepower for, for, for industrial uses. Uh, the first building there, the Cornerstone, 1816, that was the first building built there. A lot of those buildings endure today. Others, of course, were wooden and they're probably, for the most part, long gone. But anyway, well, we got all these sheep on the land, and we got some problems, great problems, with this huge flock of sheep, let's call it. Uh, number one, confinement. <coughs> how am I going to keep my sheep separate from Mary's sheep? And how is she going to keep her sheep separate from yours? What are we going to do? We cut down all the trees, so we haven't got any trees to make fences. Why a fence hadn't been invented yet. What have we got? Rocks, stones, okay? So, thousands of miles of stone walls were built in a matter of about 40 years, to con mostly to confine sheep. And I will say this, if you walk in the woods today, anywhere around here, anywhere in Hartford or Heartland or Lebanon or where, you see a stone wall. At one time, the land on either side of that wall was cleared and sheep were being pastured there. Those walls, four feet high, keep a sheep in, won't keep a cow in, all right? Amazing undertaking. Had to get feed to carry them. We have a short growing season here, so you can count on pasture to carry them for five or six months, but we got a long cold winter, we got to feed these animals. And so uh, that engaged every available male over the age of 10 years in the harvest and storage of hay, of cutting the grass. Uh, Everybody, all boys were taught how to be handy with a scythe, how to swing a scythe and cut the grass, and then how to rake it up and get it cured and gathered up and put away in the hay mow. Incredible. A scythe men, scythe boys. Incredible. Now, you know, people, there were no video games in those days. There were no soccer camps. My God, you worked, you worked, you hayed the ground to feed the animals. They had problems with predators. This was the natural habitat of the eastern timber wolf. And timber wolves, they, they kill sheep for the hell of it. Uh, sheep are prey animals, and uh, uh, getting rid of the, of the wolves was an absolute imperative. And if a wolf was known to be in the area, everything stopped. You grabbed the muskets and hunted it down and and shot it. In fact, <coughs> down on down on Manadoc in, in southwestern New Hampshire, they, they tell the story down there. The reason the top of Manadnock is bare ledge uh, is be, and Cardigan over here uh, is because the farmers uh, drove the wolves off the lowlands. The wolves took refuge up near the mountaintops where they hadn't tried to develop pasture uh, so they set fire to the mountaintops to drive the wolves out. And there's a wonderful painting in the Cheshire Historical Society of farmers drawing beads on wolves, attack, uh, uh, fleeing the raging fire on the mountaintop. 
Um, anyway, they got rid of the wolves pretty damn effectively. Then they had problems with parasites and disease. Anytime you take ruminant animals and you build up populations, you run into parasite problems, disease problems. And they had some awful time. First of all, what we call worms, stomach worms, parasites that live in the gut of the sheep. They don't, the parasites don't kill the sheep, but they debilitate the sheep and make it uh, uh, vulnerable to, to things like pneumonia, eventually killing the sheep. Uh, the, the, those people in those days, they knew they had problems with worms, but they didn't, they, they had so many sheep, they couldn't do pasture rotation like we, we try today to, to move the animals around. The, the, the cycle of uh, stomach intestinal parasites is very simple in ruminants. Uh, the mature uh, organism lives in the gut, uh, sucks blood through the intestinal wall, sheds eggs which pass out in the, in the manure. Uh, the eggs are attached to the leaves of grass. Sheep come along, eat the grass, and start the cycle over again. Well, uh, th they tried a lot of different, uh, uh, what you would call homopathic remedies. They didn't have the pharmacy that we have today to throw at intestinal parasites, uh, but they did try various means, uh, uh, concoctions to try to, to manage this worm problem. My favorite, absolutely favorite one, was this. They take a plant that was commonly grown. A lot of people grew it. And they take that plant and they would press it and get the juice and take that juice and make a tea and take that tea and force some of it down the sheep's gullet. What do you suppose that plant was? Class, anybody know? Yeah. Tobacco. <laughs> uh, tobacco is highly toxic. <clears throat> Go down to Kentucky and watch them harvest. They wear big, thick gloves. Uh, it is real poison. Well, anyway, so that, that was one thing. And a lot of tobacco was grown around here. A lot of people grew it for their own use. Uh, you'd be surprised. You realize as late as 1938, uh, there were commercial tobacco farms as far north as, as Claremont and Wethersfield. And there were two tobacco uh, cigar-making plants in Concord until about 1940, uh, and in, in Claremont as well. Uh, anyway. So another problem they had was foot rot, and that's just an infection that gets in the, in the hook, and it's prevalent when you have wet conditions and you have buildup of, of this pathogen in the hoof. Well, what do you suppose they tried to deal with that? Uh, they tried tobacco juice and other things, and then they had ticks, and there's pretty good evidence that the ticks that bother sheep here today probably came with some of those sheep that... Uh, um, Jarvis and his uh, successes brought here. And again, they, they tried pretty radical uh, uh, remedy. Uh, oftentimes what they would do is shear the sheep. Usually they sheared in June. Uh, I can't imagine in hot weather shearing sheep with hand clippers, but that's what they did. Then they would dam up a brook and put arsenic in the pond and run the sheep through it. You see, they didn't have any EPA in those days. So that was what they did to get rid of the damn ticks. Um, then the biggest problem of all, of course, was malnutrition. Um, malnutrition, because the feed they were getting, the hay that was being fed to them, really wasn't very good. As you will notice around here, uh, when uh, uh, it's late May, these big dairy farms up and down the valley they are harvesting that first crop of hay. They want to be done by Memorial Day because that's when the plant is at its peak for nutritional value. It's, it's uh, at the top for protein and digestibility and feed value. But in those days, they didn't start haying. The traditional date to start haying was the first Monday after the 4th of July. Well, what we know today is by then, you've already lost about 30 or 35 percent of the feed value of grasses. And uh, they, they didn't cut all the hay on that first day. They cut all summer long and way on over to, to uh, Labor Day. <laughs> and by Labor Day, what they were harvesting was more akin to sawdust than, uh, than to uh, good animal feed. So these sheep had to get through the winter on poor quality feed for the most part. And so with that, they had a lot of mortality. 
and we have wonderful uh, old diaries in Plainfield uh, uh, from, from, well, really from the period of 1840, 50, uh, kept by a man named Willis Daniels. And in January, you'll find an entry, shared a dead sheep today. Or father and I shared two dead sheep today. Uh, because they were losing animals all along. And just to give you an illustration of how that malnutrition played out. Uh, today, we aspire to have a 200% lamb crop, which would mean if you had 100 ewes and you exposed them to ram in November, in April, you would expect to have two, uh, from 100 ewes to have 200 babies. That would be something to shoot for. Well, in those days, they thought if they got 80%, 80, 80 lambs from 100 ewes, they'd do pretty well, meaning that some of the ewes, because they're in a depressed nutritional state, wouldn't conceive, or they wouldn't carry, or they'd die before lambing time. So that malnutrition was a huge problem. Well, the annual cycle of all of this is pretty simple. Lamb on pasture in the spring, they're getting that nice nutritious grass. The mothers will give some milk, get the babies off on a good start. Shear in June, they thought it was better to shear in June because it was hot and the wool was, the grease softened up and everything. But I've sheared sheep and that is damn hard work. I don't know how they did it in June. Uh, summer pasture. The pastures tended to be the uplands and, of course, the flat level land along the streams. That would be where you'd grow the hay. Uh, breed in late fall, winter, and very simple uh, uh, structures. Um, uh, the, they, they put the emphasis with their buildings on good storage for the hay and uh, just lean to just shelters and feed the hay out on the snow for the sheep. Uh, to give you an idea, of the extent of this, by 1835, I have a tract, a census tract, for every single town in New England for 1835. The numbers of sheep, it's pretty amazing. Uh, now, these are the sheep one year and older because that's what was taxed. And that's where the, the records came from, was tax records. Uh, 1835, the town of Hartford, 13,207 sheep. Think of it. Heartland, 9,902. Norwich had 96, 14. Pomfret, 76, 98. That adds up to 41,421. That's more sheep than are in all of New England today. Just in those towns. Just, just right nearby, right next door to us, right here in Hartford. You add those up. That is a lot of sheep. That's a tremendous number. Uh, Windsor County, total 171,581. Springfield, 17,000 head. Amazing. And Wethersfield, huge numbers. Uh, the state total, 1,099,000 sheep. That was the state of Vermont. And right across the river, Lebanon had 12,585. Hanover, 11,024. Imagine if you showed up in Hanover with 100 sheep in a trailer. I bet you'd be met by six police cruisers. Uh, <laughs> not today. Anyway, uh, so Vermont was king with over a million sheep in 1835. Uh, New Hampshire dragged along with a half a million. But that's a hell of a lot of sheep. Man, oh, man. So um, just that, that, that really gives us this, the idea of the scale of this thing. But we get to 1837, it all ends. It all goes south. It was a, a perfect storm year. Uh, uh, a, a whole series of events just came together in that year and triggered the, basically the end of this boom. It killed it. And it, it took a little while, really, for it to go down. But it started in 1837. First of all, it was an economic panic, 1837. And subsequently, a bad depression set in. Andrew Jackson had abolished the national banking system uh, at the time. It saw the equivalent of the Federal Reserve today and kicked things back to states to regulate the, the, uh, the uh, monetary supply. Uh, uh, it was a wild and woolly time. 
there was intense counterfeiting of, of currency um, drawn on the New Hampshire State Bank. And there was a discount that had to be. If you've got a $100 bill drawn on the Vermont State Bank or the New Hampshire State Bank, it may be, maybe it's bogus, you don't know, because there was tremendous counterfeiting rings in Quebec flooding down here with, with uh, funny money. Uh, the Erie Canal had been opened and railroads were being developed to the Midwest. And there is no agricultural commodity that we can produce here in Vermont or in the Connecticut Valley that somebody somewhere else can't produce bigger, better, faster than we can here. Uh, there's no commodity. Everybody says, oh, maple syrup. Oh, yeah? Go up to Quebec and take a look up there. You know, all of the United States maple production is about 25% of the world's production. 75% is right up there. Uh, it's totally industrial. Railroads opening up to Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, out there they could raise wool, they had more feed, they had better land. Everything favored that. Competition was starting to appear from Australia and the Argentina uh, began to ship wool into New England. These mill owners were saying, ah, we're not going to pay a premium for a local wool. We're going to buy it where it's cheapest. And so that was putting pressure on here. The Industrial Revolution was changing the way people live. More people working indoors. The working indoors don't need heavy woolen garments, kind of like cotton. Cotton was coming on. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was also accompanied by the, the uh, growing use of the box stove and central heat. So maybe we don't need a big woolen blanket quite so much. Uh, we, we got better heating than just fireplaces. But the biggest issue really was it w wasn't peculiar to 1837. It was already happening. And that was the exhaustion of the soils. Too many sheep for what the soil could return in the form of feed. And so uh, thus, it, by 1840, began the reversion of cleared land to forest. It started then, and it's gone on ever since. And I've seen wonderful studies done about that, that march, that progress, I uh, know, that, that process where Land on the uplands first, uh, where the soil's only four or five inches deep. It didn't kick off enough grass to sustain sheep. Uh, it just gave up and gave out. And so you began to get erosion. And people began to say, we're not going to pasture up there anymore. Let it go. And that gave rise to that great term, back to the Indians. You know, just abandon land. Let it go. They go back to forest, and it, 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 it's gone on ever since. Uh, so anyway, to, to pull us together, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the impacts of this, this period, this very remarkable period. Very short, really only about 20, uh, 35 years. Uh, very dramatic time. Uh, two things that we can see with our eyes on the landscape today. Number one, of course, is those stone walls. The U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1871 commissioned a study of the, num of the, of the stone wall, of the fence, state of fences in New England. And uh, they surveyed and came up with a number of 250,000 miles of stone walls. I mean, an incredible thing, an achievement. And you go look at some of those stone walls, they're just amazing what they did. They'll have great, big, huge pieces of stone, rocks. Uh, they had to have worked all day just to move uh, into, uh, into position. And then all, all kinds of stone to make those stone walls. It used to be said that two men uh, with a team of oxen, an iron bar, a length of chain, and a stone boat should be able to build one rod's worth of stone wall in a day's time. That's 16 and a half feet, about from here to you. Imagine if we went out and tried that. I don't think we'd get that far. Uh, have you folks had that wonderful speaker about stone walls? The guy that builds uh, stone walls right before your eyes? 
Well, if you haven't had him marry, get him up here. You'd love it. He is terrific. I Literally, he does build a stone wall, and he's speaking all the time. He's giving his lecture, and he'll have a table right in front of him. He comes with three five-gallon buckets full of pebbles, and he builds a stone wall. And when he gets done at the end of his lecture, it's about four feet long. It's about that high. Absolutely perfect. What the heck? You know, and people go up and admire, how did you do it? Oh, do it all the time. And then when it's time to go home, he just takes those buckets and just sweeps those pebbles right back into the bucket, and off he goes. Uh, uh, get that guy. You'd love it. It's a wonderful lecture. He goes all over Vermont now. Uh, anyway, so uh, those stone walls are just incredible. And that fellow, he can walk through the woods and he can say, that wall right there was built by Scotsmen. That wall over there was built by Italians. Or this wall was built by farmers. He'll explain. Some of the far walls still stand true at four feet of height and, and still strong and straight and everything. Others are kind of tumbled down, almost disappeared down into the leaves and sunken into the dirt. And uh, they just faded away. A lot of them, of course, have been taken up. Back in the 20s and 30s when we were building a lot of new road, particularly town roads, the handiest material to fill in and build a base for roads were the adjacent stone walls. But just scooped the stone walls up and made a good base for, for, uh, for roads. And then, of course, um, today, uh, a lot of people are, are converting the stone walls into uh, well, what you might call landscape or architectural uh, walls. Uh, I remember, I think it was 2009, uh, my late wife and I went down to Nantucket to see what it was all about down there. And we were on the ferry going over from Hyannis and there were two uh, big dump trucks there and they were loaded with stone walls, material, you know, stones up there. And I asked one of the drivers, oh, what's this all about? It's going out there. They don't have any stones on Nantucket, but you got all these rich people that want to have you know, beautiful walls for their gardens and so on, and they pay. I said, what do you suppose they're getting? Somebody said, oh, it's 800 bucks a ton when it's loaded, and then you got to pay the trucking and the ferry, and oh, my God. I, I heard later Mr. Madoff had, had a lot of stone walls in his place. Anyway, so think about those, those magnificent stone walls. They're really something, and they're treasures. And then the other thing, the thing we can see with our eyes, is the architecture. An awful lot of what we have around here that we say is colonial, it, it was not colonial. Uh, what you're looking at is a place that was, uh, it might have been a house pre-1810, but it was embellished and improved and upgraded if it wasn't built from scratch in this period when people had the money to spend. Same with public buildings and churches. Down in Heartland, and across the river in Plainfield and Cornish, there are, there's a little colony of seven brick churches. You know, the Heartland Roast Beef Supper Church, that one is, is one of the sisters. And they're all the same. They're all built from 1832 to 1837 out of native brick. They're all are almost identical, but those, look how they endure. But at that time, that was quite an undertaking. People had money. And they put in, they said, we're going to have a nice church. And a lot of these pretty, pretty houses around, you know, whatever period you want to call it, colonial, federal, all of that, uh, that was from the money that was generated. And then the mills. You talk about the mills. Well, right near us, of course, is, uh, well, if you've lived around here, we used to call it Rockdale. Do you remember Rockdale? Well, as you come into Lebanon on, uh, was it Mechanic Street, big brick, that, that, that's, a, that's a woolen mill uh, that's been repurposed from offices and all kinds of things. And down in Claremont, same thing, big uh, bunch of those mills. Is, uh, one's got a restaurant and it's got an inn. It's got that Red River computer, has one of those buildings. And uh, they're adapting another one into, I don't know, like 87 studio apartments. It's a huge undertaking, but those, those buildings are strong and, and uh, they can be repurposed. Uh, the ones that are wooden, they've kind of gone away. Uh, Hartford Woolen Mill, does anybody remember that one? Yeah. Uh, how about that one in Enfield there, Baltic Mill? Uh, everybody's waiting for it to erupt in flame, but so far it doesn't. But 
uh, let's wait and see. Okay, but then um, there's uh, one other thing that we have to recognize about that period of time, um, and that's this. It's uh, a social uh, one that uh, the hemorrhaging of population from rural New England that began right after the Civil War. It's huge numbers of people. People packed up and went away. Towns like Hartford, they didn't suffer it uh, anywhere uh, like uh, small towns that were back on, in the hills. If you had railroads, you had uh, uh, some kind of mill activity or whatever, uh, 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 commerce, uh, you didn't suffer. But if you were back away from from, from modern uh, uh, commercial activity, uh, you would lose tremendous amounts of population. My town right over here, just a few miles away, Plainfield, from 1860 to 1890, lost 30% of its population and 40% of its tax base. There was nobody to take over these abandoned farms, farms that people had just said, we can't make any money here, to hell with it. We're going west to farm, we'll go to California, Wisconsin, wherever, or we go to work in the big mills. We're not gonna farm. And they just walked away and towns were stuck with these inventories of, of just derelict farms, really. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that period is, very, is a fascinating period in New England history. And it was everywhere. There was a professor at Dartmouth College named Goldthwaite, 1925, wrote a book about the town that went downhill. And what he's talking about is Lyme. And he had maps of Lyme for each decade, starting in, in 1840, and how the farms were abandoned, fewer and fewer farms in little villages, little settlements. They just shriveled up, went away. So eventually you got to where Lyme is now. You got two little villages, some farming along the Connecticut River on the good soil, but it's vast forest. It's all abandoned farmland up there. Fascinating story. And uh, so uh, what, what this did, this, this tremendous loss of population, occasioned a time of melancholy, of sadness, of grieving amongst the people here. And it was, it was manifested in, in a number of different ways. Uh, one of my favorite ones was this. 1898, the governor of New Hampshire, Frank Rollins, he was trying to figure out what can we do to repopulate rural New Hampshire where we've lost so much population. What can be done? He said, I got a great idea. He said, you know, the end of July, early August, you have lovely weather. And let's have a festival. And uh, we'll have food and we'll have music and we'll have uh, speeches and people recite poetry and that kind of thing. And we'll get the people who went away to come back and see how great it is here. And that might make them want to come back and resettle right here. It didn't work for a nickel. It didn't amount to anything. But that's where the idea of old home days came from. That was his idea. It spread to Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, and a lot of towns still do it today. They call it old home week, old home day. That was to try to get people to come back and, and, and repopulate <coughs> these towns. I'm certain there are towns in Windsor County that probably went from 1,000 to 1,200 people down to 200 or 300, because that happened on, on my side of the river, down in Sullivan County particularly. Uh, Ackworth, 1,200 people in 1860. By 1920, 200. You know, just people went away. That great big game preserve, I'm sure you're all aware of it, it's called Corbin's Park. It's, uh, but it's in Plainfield, Cornish, Grantham and Croydon, a little bit in Newport. That's about 24,000 acres surrounded by a fence. And they got wild boar and elk and all kinds. It's a private game club. But it was founded by a, a, a robber baron named Austin Corbett. He owned the Long Island Railroad. He was a banker. He was the developer of Coney Island. And he wanted to have a, have a game preserve. And back in his native, uh, where he was born, in Newport, in that area. So he sent his, in the 1880s, he sent agents around to these towns and said, you got some of those abandoned farms, we'll, we'll buy them up. And um, okay, good, this is wonderful. Take this land off the town's rolls. 
uh, it's not generating any income. And uh, there were still a few holdouts, a few farms up in the area he was going to enclose with a fence. And his agents went to them and said, well, Mr. Corbin is going to bring in wild boar and he's going to bring in buffalo and all these critters. And you can stay here and keep farming if you want, but we'll give you a key so you can go in and out. You've got to open and close the gate. And people say, oh, oh boy, uh, what will you give me for my farm? I'm out of here. And that's how we put together that vast reserve. You know, it's poor Mr. Poor Mr. Corbin. Well, he wasn't poor, but what happened to him, very interesting. He got this all going. It was, if, after four or five years, it was complete and everything. And he had this big estate in North Newport. And one day, uh, he uh, and his son and the son's tutor uh, were going to go for a ride. And uh, the liverymen brought up a spirited team of horses hooked to a big phaeton, and they got in. One of the butlers came out of the house with an umbrella because it was a sunny day. And that butler, he popped that umbrella up like that. And the horses were spooked, and they took off. Runaway team went down the driveway, made a sharp turn. That wagon overturned, and Corbin and his son and the tutor were all killed. And so that was what happened to poor Mr. Corbin. Anyway, so that was a, uh, just a, a footnote to, to this, this whole thing about the change that happened when that prosperity of the sheep boom faded away and there was really nothing to take its place. And uh, so we still see it today. We see the stone walls, we see the nice architecture. Uh, only since World War II time have we begun to repopulate a bit, uh, almost getting back to maybe where we were in rural areas, uh, where we were in population in 1860. I think uh, I've, I've over-talked my time limit here. Uh, anybody have a question or anything I'd like to bring up? Uh, yes, ma'am. The, the dairy industry came with the coming of the railroad, really. It enabled the development of uh, dairying up here. Uh, of course, they, they milked cows all the way through this whole period, but the idea, uh, but to, to, to take care of the needs for milk and butter and cheese in Boston, there were dairy farms in Cambridge and Arlington. In fact, I think there were a few farms right in Boston. But then the idea was really uh, developed by H.P. Hood. And in 1847, the first uh, railroad uh, came to southern New Hampshire. And then by 1847 came to White River Junction. Well, he said, aha, why don't we milk the cows up in the country and have them have little creameries up there to manufacture butter and cheese and send the products down on the, on the train? And so that, that was the model that took hold, and it, it really uh, it flourished until about 1900 when they got the idea of, hey, let's industrialize processing in Boston and the introduction of refrigerated rail cars, and so we'll just have them put the milk in milk cans, load them on refrigerated cars, and send the milk to Boston, and we'll dump it out into vats and make butter and make cheese down there and then send the empties back. And so that was the model. Uh, and that's why we got more and more dairy farms up here. Uh, that was about the only lucrative agricultural enterprise that, uh, that, that would come along. And uh, then in 1960 uh, came a tremendous change when we said uh, the, the processors of New England by fiat, basically said, no more milk cans. No more milk cans. Everybody's got to get a bulk tank. In other words, a big vessel that will hold the milk and refrigerate it, and we'll send a tank truck out and pump that milk into a tank truck and take that down to Boston. And so a lot of farms right then said, I can't afford to buy a, a milk tank. To hell with it, I'm out. And so through the period 1960, 1970, you just saw all these hill farms just vanish. That uh, famous auctioneer, you've all heard of him, C.W. Gray, right up in East Thetford. Before he died, I talked to him about it, and he said, you know, he said, I made a lot of money doing it, but basically I sold out a way of life. You know, the hill country, 
you know, people could milk 20 cows and they raise some pigs, have a big garden and make enough money they could send a kid to college. Forget it today, it's not, not happening. Now you've got a farm in Bradford, Vermont, where they're milking 2,100 cows. Just think of that. That's 40, 50 cow dairy farms in one place. Yes? Uh, just a follow-up. I know we're talking about sheep today, but... Yeah, um, yeah. My brother was doing research on the railroads, you know, and in the 20s, is it one year, and I think it was 27, but I'm not sure. He actually has data on how many cans were being picked up by the, each passenger train as yeah. it stops coming down That's right. in each town yep. that was being all carried to Boston. Yep. Interestingly, on that in that year, there was no milk being picked up in Hartford at White River Junction because all the milk that we made in our town in that year, we were drinking it locally. Yep. It was all coming from the little towns. Yes. And not here. We yep. were just drinking it all in our either yeah. in, in Hartford or in in Lebanon or in, in Hanover. Yeah. Basically. Which is kind of interesting. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. People often will ask me, and they say, well, what about wool? We still got some sheep producing wool. What's the story? And I say, well, here's the thing. Uh, you produce some wool and you want to sell it. Uh, first of all, there's no woolen mills left in New England. There's one big one just over the border in Quebec, and they produce it for woolen fabric for Brooks Brothers and all kinds of uses like that. Um, uh, that's problem number one. And then problem number two, we can look right around the room here. <laughs> Let's see, who's got fleece on here? There's a fleece, I'll bet you. Yep, 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 there you go. Okay, that's, that, that, that has driven the price of wool down to nothing, made out of recycled soda bottles and stuff. And uh, so basically wool produced on the farm uh, up here now, unless you you figure out some way to make it into yarn, sell it yourself at the farmer's market or whatever, the wool is basically worth nothing. And there's a lot of people have what I call bo peep flocks. You know, they got three or five pet sheep and there's a, these itinerants that come around and shear. And I watched one gal, she's out of Walpole, she shears a lot of sheep around here. I watched her last fall. Uh, last spring, excuse me, and and there was this beautiful fleece, off, big, lovely you, and she said, I said, what are you gonna do with that wall? You gonna take it? Nope, it's going right over that dumpster. No use for it. This is what a shame, you know. Yeah, yeah, too bad. Yes. When you talked about the, the sheep taxes, where do you actually find the information <clears throat> at the town level? Are you going to historical societies or wherever to see like the lists of? Of how many people were getting taxed for how many sheep? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it should be in your town records. If they levied a tax, they're supposed to keep a record of it, and you should find it. It's in the town clerk's Yeah, that yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I keep going back to Plainfield because that's my home base. But in Plainfield, uh, we're very lucky. We've got every scrap of paper about the town going way back to Benning and Wentworth when he charted the town in 1761, and we put it on microfilm. And so you can go back and look up all this stuff. Wow. It, it, it's amazing. Uh, but a lot of towns don't have that. A lot of towns down through the years, of course, the town clerk's office would be in their house. And the house catch on fire and Ooh. they lose 20, 30, 40 years worth of records. <laughs> Terrible. Yes. Yes. What, what, did you, what was the tax for? What did they do? With, what was it, was it? Property tax. Property tax. Yeah. 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 Well, being a lister, I said before to other people, it would be on my anti-bucket list. <laughs> but they probably didn't have law enforcement pay, you know, to pay for, maybe schools, but I was just curious what they did with the tax money. No, no, it went right into the town hopper, the, 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 the general fund. I mean, it was just, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I hate bothering you with New Hampshire, but until 1971, New Hampshire towns taxed cows and sheep. And the selectmen on the 1st of April, selectmen are acting as listers do here, go out to each farm and go in and say, okay, Alfred, how many cows you got? And they say, I got 24. Yeah, all right. So you write down 24. How many sheep? I got 12. And they write that down. And they try to figure out, get the value, <coughs> and put it in, send him a tax bill for it. Just like, just like he's on his house and his land. 
Oh, you car, that's a, ta that's a property tax, uh -huh. yeah. And in 1971, they finally did away with it. But, uh, oh my God, I was select men when that was still going. I remember we'd go, go to a barn, we go in, and mm, well, he's got some cows in here, but I could tell there had been four or five cows standing right there, but there weren't any cows standing right there right now. <laughs> uh, what the hell? Well, Joe, what happened to those cows? Well, didn't you have some cows there? No, 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 he said, cattle dealer came through and he gave me a hell of a price to let them go. Well, what he had done, he'd taken them out and he had them tied up behind the barn. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was crazy, I tell you, yes. Yes. How did they transport the wool and wool products? Uh, by a, a cart. Uh, yeah, by, by, by whatever means. Uh, they figure out a way to get, get it, you know. It's just, the Connecticut River at all? Did they do any boat traffic to do that? Or? Yeah, there was until the dams kind of slowed that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting story. I, I, I'm sure somebody could do some research and figure that all out. But it had to go to those mills. I mean, you know, if you had a bunch of wool here, you'd find, uh, you could take it to Queechy Woolen or to the Lebanon Woolen, and that would be your market. But uh, there was, uh, uh, some guys were kind of like wool brokers. They, you'd have a lot of different farms, and they'd sell to the local guy. And he'd, t he'd accumulate them, and then he'd speculate and wait for the price to go up or whatever. But one thing I do know, I did hear the story, uh, the guy would have his hired man get buckets of water when it was about time to sell the wool, and he'd climb up in the hay mound you know, and pour water down on the wool so it would weigh more. You know, just, it was a, yes, sir? Um, these closed woolen mills, uh, the ones I see, like the Bostick in, yeah. in Lebanon and so forth, yeah. um, when did they close? Like, they closed by fits and starts. Uh, they tried to keep going. Of course, uh, in, into the 1950s, the, the, it was called Lebendale, the, the one on the, uh, what was Rockdale later, and now it's all offices. Uh, that wool would just come by rail from wherever, New York State, Michigan, wherever. And uh, gradually they would close as cotton became bigger and bigger, synthetic fabrics. Uh, and a lot of the New England textile mill, of course, went to North Carolina, and where there was cheap labor. Up here, they had fights over the unions. The Lebanon mill, its last gasp, it was burn, a, a, a crooked investor named Bernard Goldfine, who owned the mills, and uh, he uh, he got in, in battle with the union, and finally they just said, "Hell, I'm shutting the whole thing down." That was the end of it. Yeah, a lot of that, all that machinery, you know, that machinery, a lot of it was 100 years old, but it still worked fine. And it got broken up and shipped overseas and still working in places like Egypt and Sri Lanka and who knows where. Yeah, okay. All right, last question. Yes. Uh, the first passenger train out of White River Junction was what, Chrissy? June 26, 1848. So from that time on, the rails must have played a key role. In it. Oh, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, they talk about the milk train that would start at White River uh, every day. And it would go along and make these stops about every two or three miles and pick up canned milk all the way down through to Concord. And uh, I think it was on Mondays, they'd have a couple of, of uh, cattle cars on the back. And these cattle dealers all around here would bring their animals to White River Junction and load them on these rail cars. And they had a little passenger car on the back end. And these dealers would ride down to Boston, get those animals to the Brighton Market in Boston, the big slaughter plants there, and, uh, you know, smoke cigars, drink whiskey all the way down, get their money, and then come back on, on a night train. <laughs> Can you imagine? Incredible. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Enjoy it. Yep. <laughs>